So welcome back to the afternoon session of the conference. To begin with, I would like to invite Dr. Pu Chen Zhong, Assistant Professor of the Hong Kong Youth Center of Buddhist Studies, to introduce our next keynote speaker, Dr. Peter D. Hershock. Dr. Pu, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the last but second uh, keynote speech. It's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Peter Hershock. Dr. Hershock is Director of Asian Study Development Program and Education Specialist at the East West Center in Honolulu. For those of us who are not familiar with this institution, here is a bit information. The East West Center is an independent, public, non-profit organization established by the U.S. Congress in 1960. It serves as a resource for information and analysis on cr crucial issues of common concern, bringing people together to exchange views, build expertise, and develop policy options. Dr. Hershock holds a PhD in Asian and Comparative Philosophy from the University of Hawaii. His philosophical work makes use of Buddhist conceptual resources to address contemporary issues of global concern. He has authored and edited more than a dozen books on Buddhism, Asian philosophy, and contemporary issues, including literature sorry, liberating intimacy, enlightenment, and the social virtuosity in Chan Buddhism, published in 1996. Um, I'd better not read the rest of the list, because um, they are all in the program uh, booklet. Dr. Hershock's current research initiated as a 2017 to 2018 fellow of Bagarin Institute China Center focuses on the personal and the social impacts of the attention economy and artificial intelligence. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Peter Hosher. Thank you. Well, thank you for the introduction. It's my responsibility to keep everybody awake after lunch. That's not easy. I want to begin by uh, recalling something that the American inventor Thomas Edison said, and that was that time is the only real capital that any human being has, and the only thing that we can't afford to waste. And I think that's true. But I think that William James, the pragmatist philosopher and psychologist, was a little bit more precise when he declared that our life experience equals what we have paid attention to, whether by choice or default that it's the focus and quality of our attention that determines what kind of returns we will get on our time capital. Now, I think that these reflections by Edison and James are still relevant today. They were formulated in the late 19th century, but they remain relevant. And in fact, I want to go further and to say that these insights into the importance of time and attention as basic forms of human capital, in combination with Buddhist reflections on the role of samadhi, or as I would translate it, attentive mastery, in addressing conflict, trouble, and suffering are really crucial to we human beings facing perhaps the most profound predicament that humanity will ever have to face. Big data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence are transforming the human experience. They are heralding what some people refer to now as the fourth industrial revolution. And I think that there's something to be said for that description. But the revolution that is underway is really not just an industrial revolution. It's not just a technological revolution. It's a metaphysical revolution. It has a lot more in common with the Copernican revolution that 500 years ago decentered humanity's place in the cosmos. Those of you who remember your history of science know that Copernicus said that it's not that the sun goes around the earth. Against all of our day-to-day -day perceptions, our convictions day-to-day -day that the sun rises in the east and goes down in the west, and Copernicus said, look, but we've got information, we've got data. 
that makes that view impossible to sustain. And as a result, humanity was decentered, that the Earth was no longer the center of the cosmos. And that revolutionary insight of Copernicus, it dissolved convictions about the way the world works that had been resonant for millennia. And at the same time, in that process of dissolving these certainties about the world, it also opened up new forms of opportunity. And I think the intelligence revolution, as I call it, that is underway today, is going to do the same kind of thing. It's going to decenter humanity in the cosmos. And in that process, it's going to destabilize a lot of things that we have been certain about, philosophically, religiously, ethically, for thousands of years, and at the same time opening up tremendous possibilities, new opportunities. I think that smart services, smart cities, smart cities in particular, will be more efficient and that will be more livable than today's cities. I think that smart healthcare has the possibility of reaching the half of humanity that today does not have access to any medical attention. But smart services and the algorithmic tailoring of the human experience also hold prospects out for not just supplanting, I mean supplementing our intelligent human practices, but supplanting them eventually rendering human intelligence redundant. So what I want to do over the course of the next 30 minutes is to focus our attention on the intelligence revolution and the attention economy, making use of some Buddhist conceptual resources to really dig under what's actually at play here and what's at stake. Because I'm going to make the argument that we face not a technological singularity. If we ever face one with superintelligence, that'll be 50 years from now, maybe 200 years from now. But today, we are already facing an ethical singularity. And I want to make that claim stick for us and hopefully open some prospects for understanding who do we need to be present as if we are going to resolve the predicament of these, this new revolution. So the claim can be made that an attention economy has been something that's as old as humanity is. Uh, those of us who, like me today, is dressed with a sport jacket on, I don't do this for myself. In Hawaii, we don't wear sport jackets. In Hawaii, we wear aloha shirts, and you go to work, everything in aloha shirts. But this is a, a mode of respect, right? I gather your attention. I do something for you to get your attention to be, to look at me in a certain way. If I came in a t-shirt and board shorts as a surfer, you're not going to pay attention to me in the way that I do if I'm dressed properly. Same thing with regalia, displays of regalia by kings and queens. It's an attention attraction device. Women wearing makeup, men doing their hair a certain way. This is all a way of gathering attention, which has both social, economic, and indeed political benefits. So the attention economy is nothing new in that sense. But Tim Wu, in his book, The Attention Mer Merchants, makes the claim that in the 19th, mid-19th into the early 20th century, something really important happens, and that's with the advent of mass media, mass print media and mass broadcast media. Because then it became possible to gather human attention and to convert that into revenue at mass scale. To convert human attention into revenue at mass scale. Now, the first time that somebody started to theorize this was Herbert Simon, the political economist, in 1971. And he said, kind of, uh, arguing about what the attention economy is theoretically, he said, reading glasses necessary, that a wealth of attention creates a poverty of attention and a need to allocate that attention among the overabundance of information sources that consume it. So what he was basically arguing is that when we live in an information-rich world, like the one that we live in today, where anyone can go online and from any place on the planet with Wi-Fi service, access an almost endless array of possible options for entertainment consumptions, for information, for access to libraries, news, etc., and so on, for video, for imagery, all of it readily accessible with a swipe of a finger and a few uh, thumb switches. That's an amazing world. And yet, what Simon was envisioning in 1971 was that when you live in such an information-rich world, all those sources of information are trying to attract our attention. They're trying to gather our attention. And because there's so many, attention becomes a scarce resource. Attention becomes a scarce resource in an information-rich world. Now, in 1971, there was no way in the pre-internet, pre-smartphone days that Simon could envision how the attraction and exploitation of human attention could become the central driver of the global economy. That only started to become apparent 
with the kind of information on, com on computational technology advancements that took place from the 1970s into the late 1990s when the, the internet was finally put into play as a public phenomenon. And with the advent of the internet and then with smartphone thereafter, we had an entirely new realm in terms of the amazing, amazing number of information sources that are available to us, but also in the power with which our attention is being attracted. To kind of get an idea about what that's like, I think Manuel Castell's reflections on the network society are quite relevant. Because Castells was reflecting on these changes taking place in the 1980s into the 1990s. His three volume work is still worth reading for everybody. And he noted that there are two very unusual structural phenomena that go along with networks that I think are really important for understanding the attention economy. The first is that unlike hierarchies, where whether you're a member of that hierarchy, an organizational structure, whether you're a member of it depends on how far you are from the top. If you're in a university, how far are you from the chancellor or the president? If you're in a corporation, how far are you down from the CEO? In a network, whether it's important to be a member of a network is a function of the sheer number of nodes in the network, the quantity of nodes in the network, and the quality of the informational exchanges taking place through the network. The second thing structurally that's interesting is networks grow through two kinds of feedback. Negative feedback that basically says you're doing okay, the structures that you have in place are attracting users and so on the way that they're supposed to, but then also positive feedback that tells the network, look, you need to differentiate. You need to accelerate interactions and differentiate, otherwise growth is going to stagnate. Now what that means is a funny thing, and that is that successful networks will absorb their competitors. They will starve their competitors of membership. And this is referred to nowadays as the network effect. So the MIT economists Eric Brynjolfsson and John McAfee refer to what has emerged as a result of these network effects as a one, uh, say, a winner takes all economy. It's an economy in which an increasingly small numbers of business winners reap the benefits of economic growth. So if we just take a little indicator of this, you look at total advertising revenue in the United States. Today, just two companies, Google and Facebook, get 73% of all the ad revenue in the United States. And it's not just an American peculiarity. If we look globally, how many websites are there globally? A few hundred million? Four websites account for 33% of all web traffic. Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Yahoo. So contrary to the kind of popular myth that's been spread, that the internet is this new realm, democratic, open to free competition, in which any small player can get ahead and do great things, that is a myth. As Matthew Hinman has quite clearly demonstrated with lots of data to back it up in his book, The Attention Trap, or The Internet Trap, what we have now is a global economy that is structurally biased toward monopoly. It is not biased toward monopoly just simply on the basis of people wanting with the, the kinds of greed and the motivations toward personal profit that we've talked about over the course of the last day and a half. It is a structural phenomenon. Now to understand why we should worry, we need to kind of look at the infrastructure of this new system. There is a new infrastructure at place. A global sort of monopoly in terms of information exchange and connectivity is not necessarily a bad thing for consumers and users. For Facebook to be the dominant social media platform around the world is not necessarily a problem for the people using Facebook, at least at the obvious level. They get to connect with more and more people with higher quality products with a platform that is totally intuitive to use. That's a good thing for lots of consumers. And I'm going to suggest, however, that we need to be worried. And we need to be worried because of the kind of infrastructure that is developed through the internet and Wi-Fi connectivity. Now what the internet and Wi-Fi connectivity have done is they have made it possible for us to maintain connectivity, to share our information online 24 hours a day, seven days a week with absolutely incredible convenience. Now that sounds like a great deal. It sounds like a wonderful phenomenon. But it marks a real transition. Because in what I'll refer to as the attention economy 1.0, the attention economy as we knew it up until the middle of the 1990s or maybe around 2000, early 2000s. In that world, how did advertisers attract attention? Well, they're marketing at a mass scale to broad population groups 
where they take advertising and they throw it out into the world and they try to attract the interest of people on the other side in order to buy mass-produced and mass-delivered goods and services. In the attention economy 2.0, that's no longer the case. In the attention economy 2.0, consumers of e-commerce, the users of social media platforms, are now serving a dual function. On the one hand, we're geolocated consumers of informational goods and services. On the other hand, we are globally distributed producers of training data that are being used by corporations and their learning algorithms to be able to craft our experience in a way that are useful for those corporations. That is, our input, our so-called digital exhaust, all the records of everything we do, the photo sharing, the email messaging, the text messaging that we do, all of that data is being accumulated. And it is being used to train algorithms, that is, learning uh, decision-making procedures, in order to shape our behavior as consumers, and later I'll argue, as citizens. Now, all this depends on big data. Big data is the core of it. And we might have old ideas about data and how much of it's being produced. So let me give you some numbers to kind of drive home the scale of what we're talking about. In 1997, humanity was producing 100 gigabytes of data every hour. OK? That's a lot. Five years later, the same 100 bits, uh, gigabytes of data every minute. Today, 100 gigabytes of data is produced every two thousandths of a second, every two milliseconds. That amounts to 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every day. How much is that? How many of you still know what a DVD is, disc is? You know, OK, because everybody's streaming. But you remember them, right? A DVD disc has a lot of data on it. We, as humanity, now produce enough data to have a stack of DVDs from the planet Earth to the moon and back again every day. That is a lot of data. With the Internet of Things, it's estimated that by 2025, this is just six years from now, the average human being on the planet is going to be interacting with 4,800 Internet-connected devices in our watches, in our refrigerators, in our cars, the autonomous car, and everything that we engage with that has either a data reading system or a voice activated agent, we will be producing data. We will be producing, at that point, estimated six years from now, a zettabyte of data every two days. That is enough information to create 18 million years of high definition television every day. It is enough to have, for every single human being on the planet, 10 hours of high definition data every day. High definition video on every human being on the planet, 10 hours worth produced every day. That's a lot of information. Now, this might have just turned out to be data smog. This huge volume, the velocity, and the variety of big data that's being circulated, it could have just been data smog, right? But there's a funny thing machine learning. Machine learning is a system by which algorithms, these are decision making procedures. Do not just get feedback from the world and process something. They get feedback from the world and rewrite themselves in response to the feedback they're getting from the real world. These are evolutionary, or sometimes called genetic algorithms. So machine learning was discovered in the 1960s. People knew about it, but there was neither the processing speed of computers, nor was there enough data to make them effective practically. With big data, machine learning is undergoing a Cambrian explosion an evolutionary explosion that is just like the explosion that gave rise to the, the massive kinds of ecosystems that we now have and that are in such threat by things like climate change. There's a Cambrian explosion happening in the tech world. Machine learning algorithms are able to perform now at human levels and beyond in things like voice, uh, voice recognition, visual recognition, face recognition. Machine learning algorithms are capable of crunching enough data to be able to do as well as human beings can do in analyzing x-rays and seeing whether or not somebody has a tumor from the x-ray. Machine learning algorithms are now so accurate in, in face recognition and correlating that with social data that they are 83% effective in identifying whether a man or woman is gay or straight simply from the photograph. These are astonishing facts. The Chinese government said it is going to be the global leader in artificial intelligence by 2030. Why did it say this? Because 
Several years ago, DeepMind's product, AlphaZero, a game, a machine, built to do one thing, to play the game of Go. Go is an interesting game, because it's quite simple. It's about trying to capture uh, stones on a board, but it's an extraordinarily complex game. Chess, which was the previous artificial intelligence benchmark, could a, ch a machine chess player beat human beings? Eventually did. Eventually got to where it could beat all human beings. Why? Because computers were able to calculate, computationally, crunch all the data that was necessary to say, for any given move in a game of chess, what would the consequences of that move be? And could track it out far enough to be able to make fail-safe moves in playing chess. But Go is different. Chess, there's a lot of possible game moves. In the game of Go, the number of moves that you could possibly play are the same number of moves that would exist if a move equaled a particle in our universe, and you took every particle in our universe, every neutron, every proton, every electron, every photon, and you created an entire another universe. Talk about the Buddhist cosmology. Every particle in our cosmos was a cosmos of the same size as our cosmos that would still not be the total number of games, moves, in a game of Go. So you can't calculate your way to winning Go. You can only win Go by being creative and by fooling people. By fooling people into thinking you're doing one thing when you're actually doing something else. AlphaGo figured it out. It did so by taking hundreds of thousands of games that were played and recorded, analyzing those, and then playing against itself repeatedly until it played itself in the game of Go a million or more times. And then it began playing humans and eventually got to where it could defeat any human player five games to zero. That was a big deal. And the Chinese government said, if a game machine can play the game of Go that effectively, then there's something to this artificial intelligence stuff. But then DeepMind built another version, AlphaGo Zero. AlphaGo Zero was able to play the original AlphaGo first time up, and it beat the other machine 100 games to zero. Indefeatable player of Go. Alpha Zero was not given any games to play, to work through. It was not given anything to work with as a game of Go it was given the rules of the game and an incentive to win, and that's it. It taught itself how to play the game of Go. Now, that's just game playing. But today, machine learning algorithms are being used to assess loan applications. They're being used to weave through applications for jobs, to analyze the CVs of people applying for jobs, like a lot of academics on the job market all the time. Applying for those jobs, and the machine learning algorithms are the first level that you have to pass to get to a human being doing it. Same thing for college and university applications. The applications are being read by machines. Machines learning algorithms are being used in the United States to make recommendations, so-called evidence-based recommendations, on sentencing and on parole in criminal justice cases. Why? Because it's efficient. Because a machine learning algorithm doesn't make different choices be before lunch and after lunch. A machine learning algorithm is tireless. It doesn't get tired. It doesn't fatigue. It simply does what it's told to do and gets better and better and better at doing what it is being trained to do. So machine learning is an extraordinarily powerful new phenomenon in the world. Artificial intelligence goes a step further. Artificial intelligence is not just machine learning. It's actually taking human cognitive functions and mimicking or modeling those human functions. And the kind of turning point event took place in the early 2000s when the Defense Administration Research, uh, Research Programs Agency, DARPA, funded some programs at Stanford University, the point of which was to develop a personal battlefield assistant, an, an electronic assistant, an artificial agent that could, on the battlefield, make complex decisions in response to rapidly changing battlefield conditions to undertake complex sets of orders, execute those orders, explain why it was doing what it was doing, and to respond robustly to surprise. An extraordinary challenge that was put to the team there at Stanford. After five years of the highest funding that DARPA had ever put into anything with artificial intelligence, they said, we've got what we wanted. Thank you very much. And you can take whatever is, doesn't belong to the government, that's not military, you know, uh, proprietary, and you can start to make use of it. And you all know that as Siri. So the same team that developed this agent, this military agent for, the, for DARPA, spun off and created a new company called Siri. 
That turned into later Apple's Siri. So Siri was originally not just a search engine. That's what the Siri is now. You open your iPhone and say, you know, Siri, hi, how are you? What's the best, you know, uh, dim sum restaurant within a mile from where I stand right now? And Siri will respond to you, voice activated, right? But now we have not just search agents like Siri, voice activated search agents. There are voice activated do agents. Look up Viv, V-I-V, Viv Incorporated. Viv is a conversational agent. Viv, you can tell what you want to do and it will execute your orders. Viv is able to take human intentionality and to write that into actionable code in a matter of milliseconds. So what you do with Viv is you say, tomorrow night is my wife's birthday. I'm not going to be there. I want to deliver her a dozen roses, make sure that my son takes her out for dinner, order a car to show up to pick her up for dinner and my son, because my son doesn't have his driver's license yet, take them to our favorite dinner and make sure that they have a nice white wine to pair with the fish. Viv will do it all, simply from your verbal instructions. Artificial agents are now serving as counselors. They're serving as personal trainers. They are everywhere around us, and the biggest investments that are taking place in Silicon Valley are all about virtual personal assistants. Why? Because of the power of conversational commerce. If you simply ask for something, and it is delivered to you, it's extraordinarily powerful. Now, it might seem that this is all about corporate interest. But this kind of power, the kind of data generation, the data use that's being done by corporations around the world, not just in the United States, but around the world, it's happening everywhere. In the United States, we've got debates about privacy. In China, not so many debates about privacy and the use of data. The EU, even more worries about privacy. But if you look around the world and see what's actually happening, there is now a competition for arranged marriages and the progeny of arranged marriages. The arranged marriages are between what we can call the attention economy and the surveillance state. Because governments want the same data that the corporations want. Why? Because they can then figure out how to shape us to be not the kinds of consumers that they wish us to be, but the kinds of citizens they wish us to be. It's an extraordinary power. It used to be that if you go back 100 years, we would talk about the great game. The great game was the game that was being played among a marriage between states, imperial states, and commercial interests to carve up the world and to exert dominance in the, in the control of land and labor. There's a new great game being played. It depends as well on the marriage of commercial and state interests. In the new great game, however, it's not about land anymore. It's not about labor. What it is about is the colonization of consciousness itself. It is about locking in attention share being able to gather the intelligence that is being sent through this new infrastructure of Wi-Fi and the internet, because every time we pay attention to something, our time online, it's like our attention is a radio wave, uh, an electronic media, electromagnetic phenomenon. And on that is carried intelligence, our decision making, our values, the things that we like, that we don't like. All of that is carried with our attention when we make decisions online, when you say like and don't like on Facebook, that's intelligence. It's human intelligence being uploaded into these artificial agents that are ambient, that are working tirelessly to try to shape our experience in ways that are consonant, not necessarily with the corporate interests, but with our interests, our values, our desires. There is a new domination going on. It's a domination that depends on this marriage, however it's configured. It's differently configured in the US, the EU, and say China, for example. But the bottom line is that you have this marriage of the attention economy and their surveillance state. And the colonization of consciousness is not one where the logic of domination is that of coercion. No one is being coerced into doing this. The logic of domination is that it feeds our craving, our very desires, our dreams for who we want to be. Who we present ourselves are in social media is data about what we value, what we desire, what we want. And it is that that is then being fed back to us repeatedly in an ongoing feedback loop where machine learning algorithms get better and better and better at giving us what we want. Now that might sound like a technological dream come true. What's wrong with getting what you want? Isn't that what we all desire at some level? And I think it's here where Buddhist resources really come in handy. Because as you might hear from this 
this kind of contrast between domination through coercion, which we all kind of want to resist. Nobody would like to be pushed into doing things. But when we're put in a position where what we are offered is emancipatory freedoms of choice, choose to connect with whatever kind of websites you like, choose to listen to whatever kind of music you want, choose to be able to, to purchase any kind of clothing or other commodity that you like from anywhere around the world, and if you live in China, it will be delivered to your door. Harder to do it in the US, but everything, you just do it on your phone, Alibaba Pay, one system, and it shows up. It's extraordinarily powerful to be able to get what we want. Now, the Buddhist insight into this is that everything works interdependently. We've heard that mentioned before. And interdependence is an interesting thing because on a sort of a theoretical, metaphysical level, what it means is that there are no individually existing things or beings in the cosmos at all. Everything arises relationally. If we want to put this in the strongest possible terms, we all are relational beings. We exist only relationally. Relational dynamics are more basic than the things related. It's not that interdependence in a Buddhist way of understanding this is that you have a thing existing and another thing existing and another one, and they somehow have these contingent relationships with one another. Buddhist interdependence is about an internal relationship. It's constitutive relationality. That relational dynamics are more basic than things related. Now, the therapeutic benefit of seeing things that way is that it becomes apparent that, my gosh, it's not the case, that when I have conflict, trouble, or suffering, that this is simply a matter of chance or of natural law playing out or of divine fiat. What one begins to see as one becomes adept at seeing the world as arising interdependently is to see that our conflicts, trouble, and suffering are a result of our own karma. That is, our own actions put into play in accordance with our values and our intentions. That karma is a process according to which patterns in our values, intentions, and actions result meticulously, without fail, in consonant patterns of outcomes and opportunities. Consonant patterns of experiential outcomes and opportunities. That if we want to change the relational dynamics that we are a part of, that indeed are constitutive of who we are, then we have to change our values, our intentions, and the ways in which we are putting those into practice. This is true personally. It's also true socially. It's true economically. It's true politically. It's true institutionally. That institutions are embodiments of patterns of human values and intentions that are put into practice by means of which we build these institutions. So the basic Buddhist practice, I think if we just kind of strip away the sort of metaphysical story, the basic Buddhist practice is really quite simple. Develop the kind of moral clarity that is clarity about values and intentions and how important our values and intentions are in engaging the world and creating the circumstances by means of which our relational dynamics are put together. The second thing is to develop the kind of samadhi, the attentive, the attentive mastery to be able to concentrate and affect change when we're in a position to do that. When we decide that we want to change a set of values based on our moral clarity, our shila, then we're able to put that into action because we have the attentive mastery to know and to remain sustainably present to be able to generate that kind of new change. And what does that take in order to pull it all together? Well, it takes wisdom. It takes not just knowing that things are the case, simple factual knowledge. It's not simply know-how, practical knowledge about how to get things done. It's knowing whether to do things or not. That's what prajna is. That's what uh, wisdom is in this system. So the basic pattern of Buddhist practice is to try to figure out how do we relinquish the horizons of what until now we have considered relevant to making our decisions and organizing our values and intentions and our actions, Take the horizons of relevance and expand those. Dissolve that horizon. Take a higher position. You can see so much further up from the stage than down below. So we relinquish our horizons of relevance, responsibility, what we consider ourselves responsible for, and also readiness, our horizons of readiness. How ready are we to engage our situation in a way that will, with responsibility, respond to the situation they're a part of in a way to realize increasingly liberating relational dynamics. So this is the bodhisattva ideal. And interesting, the bodhisattva ideal is one in which human freedom 
the freedom to engage others in ways that no matter what the situation is, no matter what the relational dynamics are, to be able to engage the situation in a way that will result in increasingly liberating or enlightening relational dynamics. What does that require? Improvisational genius. This is what was referred to as upaya. Skillful means is a really anemic uh, translation of upaya. If you look at what upaya functions as, upaya is the reward that one gets by clearly making a commitment, a commitment to engaging the world in such a way that we will change our complexion, our patterns of values, intentions, and actions in order to bring about liberating relational dynamics. And the result of that commitment, that vow, is freedom, this, Im this improvisational capability. Now, if we live in a world where we have machine learning algorithms and artificial intelligences that are ambient, they are all around us. The factories of the fourth industrial revolution are not brick and mortar. They are computational. They exist all around us. The machine learning algorithms are working tirelessly and creatively in order to take our, our digitally expressed desires, our digitally expressed values, and to feed those back with us in a way that we will never experience anything we don't like. Is that a good thing? I don't know. You know, I'm 64 years old. And one thing I've learned in over six decades of life is that I've grown the most when I've really disappointed somebody else or myself. When I've made a mistake, I'm forced to reevaluate, to think, how did it happen that I got divorced from an amazing woman? How did that happen? I have to rethink myself and change in response to real world feedback that I thought I was doing everything just fine. And obviously, I wasn't. If we live in a world where we have machines that are tirelessly giving us everything we wish for, we will be forfeiting our basic responsibility for our own attention because these machine learning algorithms, their basic purpose is attract, hold, and exploit our attention. But William James, Thomas Edison were right. Time and attention are the only capital we have. If we are not in charge of our own time and attention, we don't own the fruits of our own labor, much less own the means of production. What we are forfeiting is our right to a future, a right to a future in which we can act as agents for bringing about liberating relational dynamics. The interesting thing about the attention economy and the, and the intelligence revolution is that we live in a world in which we will have machine systems that are the equivalent of the Buddhist wish-fulfilling gem. They will give us everything we want, everything we wish for, any experience we would like to have, especially with virtual reality. And where that's going to go, we will be able to experience anything we desire. And I think it's important to reflect on the fact that the gods don't get enlightened in Buddhist traditions. What we're describing is a technological system for giving us godly lives. Lives in which we will, however, live on what amount to karmic cul-de-sacs, relational dead ends. There, we will live in residences that will have everything that we like, that will be appointed with the aesthetics that we so much crave to have, that will respond to our every desire. Simply by speaking, we will be able to get what we wish for. In that kind of a world, the futures that we will share will be the futures that represent what we have given our attention to, what we have given our responsibility for deciding how we orient ourselves in the world. We need to take it seriously, because I think we have just a short window of opportunity. The intelligence revolution is ongoing. It is an ongoing phenomenon. If we start now, we have the possibility, because the systems, the corporate systems and the state systems, in this marriage of the attention economy and the surveillance state, they depend on our data. The ambient intelligences that are working to shape our lives as consumers, as citizens, as members of families, that are trying to get us to use smart services for things like remembering and researching, but also parenting and educating. The smart services sound like a great thing up front, but they're Trojan horses. 
Because what they do is they bring into our midst the possibility of machine learning algorithms from the inside out transforming our lives and our experiences. But interestingly, they rely on our data. So we are in a position as both consumers and as producers through this new infrastructure to leverage an unprecedented kind of power that was not the power of the people that operated within the, within the attention economy 1.0. At least at this particular juncture, maybe for another five or 10 years, I think, we as consumers, we as producers of data are actually in a position to shape our global futures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hasha. And so the session is open to the floor now. If you have questions, please raise your hand. The gentleman over there. Get down off the dais a little bit. Uh, if everything is taken care of, do we need money anymore? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how you mean the question. But there are people who are speculating that with machine learning and combining that with three dimension, 3D and soon to be 4D printing, that we will soon be in a position to be able to create out of basic resources all of our needs like chairs and furniture and clothing and so on, print them in the home on site in response to our expressed desires. So in that sense, some people are saying, yeah, maybe we get to a point when we don't even have any need for material factories. We can actually get to the point that we don't have that. And people might say, well, this is a really wonderful thing. You know, then isn't it the erasure, the end of poverty? One of the statistics that I gave you, and this bears on the idea of money, is labor. And what it's doing, what these new technologies are doing to the world of work. In a 2016 report to the United States uh, Executive Office, that's the office of the president, it was estimated that while it might be the case that within the next 15 years, as few as 9% of all jobs would be eliminated by AI, the report said that 47% of all core job activities would be taken over by AI. And when most people hear something like that, they think, oh, that's going to mean our factory workers are going to be put out of work. It's not just them. It's going to be cab drivers and truck drivers and people who work the trains. There are now mines in Australia that have no human beings working in them. They are totally automated. Everything from crunching the soil, pulling out the rock, sorting it, driving it up, processing it, all done by machines with no human beings involved. But we've sort of reached the limit of that. People working in robotics are saying, we're sort of at a limit with things like dexterity. We're not going to get a robotic masseuse anytime soon. We're not going to be able to get a robot to do you know, acupressure and, you know, on you. Probably not, not anytime soon. What we're talking about is service jobs and white collar jobs. And to give you kind of an idea that this is just one of those mind-blowing sort of experiments that was done that gives you a real insight as to where these technologies are going. 2013, IBM supercomputer Watson was given 70,000 pages of medical reports about the use of enzymes to treat cancer. So this is in 2013, quite a while ago. All of the data that it was given was 10 years old or older. So it was written prior to 2003. Watson was able in one afternoon to predict seven out of the nine discoveries about using enzymes that took place over the subsequent 10 years. That's extraordinary power. Uh, design, people doing design work, engineering. Uh, humans have been working on how to do race car, you know, racetrack driving for a long time. You know? And then they put an AI on it and said, design a better race car. And what the AI did was it figured out that, hey, it's going around a circular track in the same direction. Why is the chassis built flat? It just raised the outside edge of the chassis so it could accelerate completely through all the turns. No one ever thought about doing that as a human being. This is creativity, right? So when we talk about money, do we need money? Go to China now. I went to China last year with my son to put him in a language program in Xiamen and went downstairs uh, in the hotel complex to get some stuff for breakfast, you know, some yogurt or something. And uh, after what we want, went to the checkout counter, put out cash. No, they don't take cash. I took out my Chinese debit card. No, they don't take debit cards. Only you could use your phone to buy. You only could use your phone. You had to use Alipay or one of the other web-based pay platforms. So we're moving in that sense to a world without money. And then what are the consequences of that? That we need to think through. 
Um, Ernest. Professor, thanks for your very thought-provoking presentation. Uh, I have one quick statement and then want to have a follow-up question. Um, I, I think from the presentation, it's quite obvious um, that uh, I think people are so uh, concerned about artificial int intelligence, but at the same time have not really think about how much human intelligence could be developed. Uh, and you talk about attention, like how we can take back our attention. Um, thinking about kind of our generations in the uh, 30s, 40s, like we still have a transition where we're not born with smart uh, device. So, so we still experience like what the what the, what it feels without all these attention attention seeking device. But for the newer generations, in the last ten years, they born the baby know how to to do with uh, yeah. uh, touchpad whatever. Do you think they should be regulated? I think that's my question. Yeah. Questions about regulation are really tough because you know so much depends on who's doing the regulating. And if we just look at sort of global policies about AI right now, and let's just say there's three sort of competing models, the Chinese, the American, and the EU, really different sensibilities are being brought to play in those three. They represent really different cultural values. But AI is global. And so what's happening is there's a competition for market share. Each one of them wants to take global market share in the AI business, right? And they're competing for one another. And they're very different visions about the relationship between humanity, technology, and the world. And the funny thing is, is in that relationship now, technology is not a passive player. Now the technologies, these artificial intelligences, are active agents. That's why we have this ethical singularity, because we've never been in a position before where our technologies were participating in reshaping the relationship we humans have with the world. It's in accord, at least at this point, with the human values that are being invested in these machines. But when people say, well, could we have regulations that would limit AI to only being developed in ways that are aligned with human values? You hear a lot about this. It sounds really good. But I've spent a lot of time in China. My wife is uh, Chinese Thai. My son is raised you know, bicultural in Hawaii. And I can tell you, there is no such thing as an agreement about what basic human values are. So what we need is a different way of engaging the question. And when it comes to should there be regulation, governmental I worry about for a whole host of reasons. Should there be parental regulation? Yes, by all means. And I think that one of the things that I'm personally coming to grapple with is I have a 17-year-old. And you know, he grew up in the digital world. So for him, you know, I asked him, you know, you're 17, and he's having troubles with his mom, and I'm talking with him about the troubles he's having how they argue with one another and why. I said, do you ever talk to your friends about this stuff? He said, no. Why not? You can't risk that. I mean, what if you tell somebody something about your mom or your family and then it goes on the web? Everybody's going to know your business. You can't make yourself that vulnerable. And I started thinking about what he was really telling me. What he was telling me is that he's not having emotionally rich relationships with other people. And I'd been thinking this for a while, that his friends seemed to be kind of thin on the ground in terms of what the friendship actually entailed. And it made me realize that you know, emotions, if everything is relational, emotions are relational phenomena. They're not subjective events that occur inside of us in the body. These are active negotiations about the meaning of the relational dynamics that we're a part of. And guess what? If we don't talk about it to other people, we don't engage others and say, I'm so mad at somebody. And they say, why are you so mad? And then you get feedback, well, that, you shouldn't be that mad about that. And how are you mad? How do you express? If you're not involved in any of that, you become emotionally stunted. It's just like any other relationship. You have to invest time and energy in order to understand something like love. I mean, a two-year-old's love, a 20-year-old's love, hopefully a 60-year-old's love should be very different things. They should be entirely different in what they take into account, what's considered relevant and responsible, and what you're ready to do in the relationship to express your love. And that's something you have to develop over time in community with others. And what I see in this younger generation is the possibility that they consume their emotional responses from media that are being produced for the purpose of attracting their attention so they'll pay attention more to the media so that the media can get better at being able to feed them things that will then lock them further into the system. I think, yes, we need that kind of inside the family regulation, but also a demonstration by the parents that they themselves are taking this seriously. That when they go out to dinner, they're not looking doing this on their phone all the time. 
which sadly you see too many people doing. Uh, it's a pity that uh, we may not have time for more questions. So um, yeah, uh, but you're welcome to interact with uh, Dr. Herschel later on during break. So uh, let's give a big hand thank to you for thank your Dr. Herschel. So now we're going to have a break of about 15 minutes and after the break we'll have more presentations in this hall and there will also be a parallel panel discussion session conducted by Wenbo Hinhong, Mr. Andrew Fong and Mr. George Leung with Dr. Ernest Ng as the moderator. The theme is Sustainable Finance, a Buddhist Perspective. So if you're interested, please go to room 3.04 on the third floor. So see you again in a moment. Thank you.